All right, uh, let's get the session started. Thanks for coming to the la last session before the free afternoon. I know you have a choice, and you can also just start your afternoon adventures early, so thanks for coming. So let's start the session with a talk on a new quantum algorithm. It's going to be an efficient quantum algorithm for the principal ideal problem and class group problem in arbitrary degree number fields. The talk's going to be given by Jean-Francois Bias, and it's joint work with Frank Song. Thank you. So uh, first, I would like to specify that it's not completely new, and it says on the slide it was um, work from um, 2016 that was presented uh, about a year ago by Fang at the SOTA conference, uh, Theoretical Computer Science. So it's like a year old. So um, it concerns the search for um, solutions to problems in computational number theory for which we can uh, uh, propose exponentially faster solutions using quantum computers. Okay, that's been um, like that's been an important motivation for um, quantum information theory, uh, showing that there are computational problems for which quantum computers clearly outperform uh, the classical ones. So one um, really famous example is the factoring and discrete logarithm uh, qu uh, um, resolution quantum algorithm from Peter Shor. Uh, it's been also the, the main motivation for uh, the creation of an entire new field of, of, of cryptography they call post-quantum cryptography because, as you know, uh, most of the public key crypto that is deployed uh, to this date relies on, on the hardness of factoring. And based on the same sort of framework, uh, there has been other uh, quantum algorithm described to solve some um, um, other uh, related computational tasks in number theory. So some of, some of them are computing the unit group of a number field, computing the ideal class group of a number field, solving what's called uh, the principal ideal problem, which consists of uh, finding generators, uh, finding a generator of a principal ideal. And for these, well, it's been a process. So first, um, for during the past decade, there has been solutions that were proposed for dealing with instances where um, the families of inputs that we're considering live in fixed degree number fields. Um, and then recently, uh, there has been um, a breakthrough where the unit group of number field was calculated in, in, in polynomial time even for arbitrary degree. And it's, it's work from uh, uh, Eisentrager, Hallgren, Kitaev, and my co-author, Feng Song. So um, in this work, we're, I mean, in this uh, presentation, I'm going to show how we extended the work of, of uh, Eisentrager and, and her co-authors to um, other problems uh, in number theory, which include principal ideal problem and class group problem. But as, as I'll show, it's actually uh, we, we have a wide variety uh, of problems that we can solve using the same general framework. So um, as I said, we have a wide uh, variety of problems. The original motivation was the resolution of the principal ideal problem and the class group, because usually in most of the previous work, uh, the previous state of the art, uh, the unit group, the principal ideal problem, and the class group were always solved together, more or less. Uh, turns out that we realized that we had to, and it's, it's something that we'll discuss later during this talk, we had to rely on the computation of a different object. And from this uh, computation here, compu computing the what's called the S units, and I'm going to describe what it is later during the talk, then you have all the solution. You can derive solutions to all sorts of computational problems in number theory that include our original motivation. But in fact, you have, you have more than that. And dot, dot, dot includes things like relative class groups, um, Selmer groups, and, 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 yeah, and, and maybe more that we haven't even thought about. So, um, the, um, so these are. Um, problems in number theory that, you know, just to define those problems and as the objects that we're computing, it, 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 if I want to make a self-contained uh, presentation of those, um, those problems, it's going, to, it's going to take quite a, quite a long time and eat a certain proportion of my talk. So what I want to do is I want to justify the study of the principal idea problem and norm equations. And I want to say, well, in this talk, I want to say as little as possible about number theory. 
okay, and focus on, on the quantum the quantum algorithms that, that we used. So I'm going to motivate the study of the principal idea problem with um, post-quantum cryptography, which, as I said, is a great source of motivation for uh, uh, the description of quantum algorithms, and also norm equations, because it's kind of easy to see how this intersects um, very fundamental problems in number theory. So a norm equation, it's uh, the an equation of the form norm of an element in the field equals something. Okay, and this particular example taken from uh, Denis Simon's uh, PhD thesis tells you that one other way to reformulate this norm equation is this equation here. So when you don't know the definition of the norm, norm equation is hard to get excited about it, but when you see here that there is actually a simple equivalent formulation of this norm equation, then, then you understand that, that this, is, this is a very fundamental problem in number theory, and it's known as, um, it's known as Hilbert Tenth Problem. Uh, the resolution, I mean, the deciding whether an equation of this form has integral solutions is a, is a fundamental problem, which in fact does not have any general solution. So that, uh, put differently, there is no general algorithm to solve a Diophantine equation. However, we do have a general equi uh, algorithm to solve a norm equation, which means we have a large uh, variety of norm equations for which, I mean, of such Diophantine equations for which we know how to uh, provide systematically a uh, solution. And uh, taken from Denis Simon's um, uh, thesis, you know, the solutions are of this form. That's not really uh, important. What's important is that it can decide these are rational solutions, and it can decide that in fact there are no integral solutions. So really providing an answer uh, to the problem whether or not uh, the, dis the decision problem, whether or not there is a solution to such an equation. Now, from a more practical uh, perspective, in cryptography, there has been a lot of schemes uh, described that use lattices. And then for the sake of efficiency, people have used uh, lattices that in fact live in, in number fields, which, which are ideals in fact. And it turns out that uh, if you know how to solve the principal ideal problem efficiently, then like other works, other recent works, have shown that in fact this threatens the security uh, of those new proposals relying on ideal lattices. So for example, some proposals have decided to uh, rely on the hardness of, I mean, the, assume, the presumed hardness of um, finding a short generator of a principal ideal. And that includes a variety of, of, of schemes, uh, such as, well, I mentioned the multilinear maps, uh, okay? that's. That's one thing that they liked about uh, those schemes, that they would allow you to do some kind of um, multi-partite uh, key exchange. But also people have proposed those sorts of schemes because they would allow them to achieve fully homomorphic encryption, which is another crucial stake in cryptography. And also, uh, they thought at some point that because it was relying on, on lattices in high dimension, perhaps it was going to be quantum safe, and that didn't go well. And that didn't go well because in recent work from uh, Kramer, Duca, Pikert, and Regeff, it was shown that finding a short generator is not really mu that much harder as finding a generator. And combined with this work, finding a generator, it can be done in polynomial time with a quantum computer. Now, there has been also other, another family of schemes that rely on the so-called ring learning with error problem. And well, um, the security, the proof of security of, of this problem uh, is it relies on the, the, the assumption that an approximate solution, I mean, it is hard to find approximate solutions to what's called the short vector problem. Uh, we call it SVP. And when we say approximate solution, well, it means finding a vector whose length is within a factor gamma of, of the shortest vector of your lattice. Now, it turns out that, so there has been even more recent work from Kramer, Dukan, and Veselovsky that said that, uh, in fact, for some approximation factors gamma, 
the, uh, the reduction, their SVP, the gamma SVP, reduces to the, the, the problem of finding a generator in the principal ideal. So again, a problem for which we're providing a polynomial time quantum solution. So why this is interesting? Well, because then here again, we have an example of a quantum algorithm that outperforms the best known classical algorithm by a super polynomial um, uh, improvement factor here the BKZ algorithm would solve gamma SVP for the same gamma in time that expo is exponential square root n. And here, uh, we present an, under that uh, heuristic reduction, we present an algorithm that, that would solve the same problem in polynomial time. Uh, now, just a word about the, implica the security implications with respect to ring and level UE. I'm not saying any of it is broken. First of all, because the, the, the proof of security of ring and level UE under uh, the assumption that uh, gamma SVP is hard is only for very small gammas. So the kind of gammas that we have here does not threaten that, that proof of security. And even if you did, fi uh, if you did find uh, a pay um, an algorithm that solves SVP, it does not necessarily mean it will uh, find you the solutions to the ring LW problem. It's just a security reduction, okay? So just want to make sure that I'm not claiming we broke anything in this work. But it, it is really relevant. Now, here is the general outline of, um, of, um, uh, of how, so how, this, how this worked out. So we have a bunch of problems. So principal ideal problem, class group, norm equation, and dot, dot, dot for uh, many other uh, problems. I mean, some other problems that in number theory that we found, we found interesting. And these, we show that they, for the most part, classically uh, uh, reduced to the problem of finding S units in your number field, okay? So that's mostly classical. And the dot, 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 there's the ray class group problem. In fact, that one, you need an, you need an oracle for discrete logs and, and factorization. So it's not quite classical. But for the most part, every, all the techniques that will reduce these problems to S units is essentially classical. And then we are going to show that this is this can be turned into an instance of the so-called hidden subgroup problem. And then we're going to show how, um, how that instance of the hidden subgroup problem, we can use uh, the state of the art uh, known uh, from um, the Holgren, um, uh, Eisentrager, Holgren, Kitaev, and Song paper. OK, so first, I'm going to remind the audience of what the hidden subgroup problem is and, and which exact um, um, algorithms we're using to solve the hidden subgroup problem because there's been many variants of this problem described. Then I'm going to finally uh, say a little more about the S units and how the fact that how computing the S unit group re reduces to an instance of the hidden subgroup problem. So the hidden subgroup problem, so the, it's, there has been um, uh, several interesting problems and computational problems in number theory that can be reduced to the problem of finding a subgroup of a certain group, G. Okay? And the way, the way it's usually done, and here I'm not giving uh, details, the way it's usually done is to say, well, let F be a function, okay? And a function that goes from my group to quantum states, and then if uh, basically, if that function satisfies the property that f of x plus y equals f of x if and only if y is in my secret subgroup, then we say that f hides the subgroup. Okay, and so there has been some. Uh, so there has been a large body of work devoted to uh, the resolution of the hidden subgroup problem. And the, the the tricky case is when you're dealing with subgroups of R to the m because the discretization causes troubles when um, the degree goes to infinity. So, and, and the, so in, in, in Eisentrager, Holgren, Kitaev, and Song uh, 2014, they got rid of that problem. But the previous state of the art, it was limited to cases where you would discretize uh, R to the M for a fixed M. Okay. So here's how it works. You want your function from R to the M to quantum states you, so you, first of all, you want it to hide your, your, your subgroup H, which will ultimately, I mean, whose knowledge will give you the solution to your problem. And so what it means is essentially that you know, when you have 
uh, x and y uh, in h, h minus y in h, so x equals y mod h, then you should get the same quantum state. But you need extra, you need extra conditions. So, and this, this comes from the work of, of Eisentrager and, 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 and her co-authors. Um, you need extra uh, properties on that function that basically tell you that when you have, um, when you take the states that are uh, that rise from points that are very close together in your uh, in the, your in R to the M, then you will get states quantum states that are very close. And when you um, relook at the states that come from uh, points that are far, uh, 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 what did I say, uh, far apart, then the, the quantum states were going to be uh, close to orthogonal. And of course, this is a hand waving sort of uh, description of that, but they are more rigorous. Um, more rigorous um, um, definitions of what I mean by if x is far from y, then the states are orthogonal, and if they're close, then the states are close together. Okay, and then given a function that satisfies those conditions, and only if it does satisfy those conditions, then you can apply uh, the quantum uh, uh, solver for the hidden subgroup problem. So um, but I will need the notion of a lattice, and so it's, now is a good moment to describe what a lattice is, uh, because what you're looking at here when you apply the hidden subgroup polymer in R to the M, you're looking at a subgroup, a discrete subgroup of R to the M, which turns out to be a lattice. And what a lattice is, it's the, all the integer linear combinations of a, a set of points in R to the M. So in dimension two, for example, it looks like a grid. And so they can be defined by you know, the basis of those two vectors, or it can be defined by these vectors. But at the end, what it looks like, it's an infinite grid made of all the red, red dots here. So that is a lattice, okay? And we're gonna need, what we're gonna need to do here is we're gonna have to say, well, we wanna compute those S units, that's our goal. And we have to say, well, finding the S units is going to be the same as finding a lattice in R to the M. And that I'm going to give a little more details. So that problem of identifying the solution to um, uh, a problem, computational problem in number theory as the search of a lattice in R to the M or a subgroup of, a G, of, of G is not new. It started off. I mean, the problem of factoring integers can be reformulated as a solution to um, the hidden subgroup problem uh, in Z. And then finding, di such, uh, finding discrete logs can also be reformulated as a solution to the hidden subgroup problem. And then it's been known that unit group, principal value problem, class group, these are all problems that could be uh, rewritten as, as um, I mean, reformulated as the search for a subgroup. So it's not, that idea itself is not new, but making it work in large degree is the main contribution of our, of our paper. And of course, other problems work for a uh, non, non-commutative group. In particular, I mean, I personally have worked in, on, on, on dihedral groups because the, this, the, the hidden subgroup problem there can give you, for example, the solution to the, the hidden shift problem, which, which can arise in some computational problems in number theory as well. So, um, as I promised, I'm going to give a little bit of details about what it is to compute S units and what they are, really, uh, before we dive into the quantum uh, reduction to the hidden subgroup problem itself. So, um, so number fields, um, what they are, so Q, the rationals, is a number field. And any finite extension of Q is also uh, a number field. Now, we're going to need to talk about ideals. Uh, so, um, so ideals is a notion of, of algebra. Uh, it's a set in K that has nice properties. So the ideals of K, they have, they have a variety of properties. Uh, so including that they're stable by addition. Okay, they have it's an algebraic structure that they're stable by addition and also they're stable by multiplication by an integral element. Okay, so ideals are sets in K, but the reason why they're called ideals is because of another property that they have, which is that they factor as a product of prime, of prime ideals. So certain ideals are primes 
And any ideal can be written as a product of prime ideals. And that's the reason why they were called ideals, because the, it's ideal stands for ideal numbers. So they were described originally uh, by Dedekind because they wanted to, what mathematicians wanted to do was get rid of the problem that Unlike, unlike in Q, when you work in a number field K that is a, a, like, a, 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 like a strictly, like a non-trivial extension of Q, you do not have a unique factorization, okay? And while those ideals, they have a unique factor, they behave like, like numbers, self-respecting numbers, uh, which have the property of unique factorization, okay? And now what I say here, I describe that particular ideal, okay, which is a set which contains alpha, an element in K, and it is actually the smallest such, I mean the smallest ideal that contains alpha. I will call it the ideal generated by alpha, okay? And that is essential in the definition of the S units because given a certain set of prime ideals, then the S units are all those alphas such that the corresponding principal ideal factors as a product of primes that's only in S, okay? Now, if you want to think about it as in terms of the simple, uh, the simple example of Q, well, you could say S equals uh, the set of uh, the primes two and three, and the group of S units in Q would be all those rational numbers that can be written down as a power three times power five. And what's interesting about that is you can reformulate this by saying, well, it's all those numbers such that you can multiply them by a power of three and a power of five and get one. And that's this formulation we're gonna use to express this whole thing as, as, as a, a, a subgroup. And well, the principal idea problem, since, since, we're, at, since we're, we're at it, it's the problem of finding alpha given the ideal generated by alpha. It's actually not an easy problem. And as I said here, we were getting rid of the, of the nasty dependency on, on the degree of the field that used to be exponential. Now let's see how the nice properties of the S unit allows you. So at that point, I'm asking you to trust me that all our problems basically reduce to the problem of computing S units. And it's something that I'm not going to give details on because it's more on the number theory side and not so much on the quantum information side. Now, we're going to have to see how we can turn this problem of computing S units into an instance of the hidden subgroup problem. So, and again, here we're, we're, we're using the previous state of the art where it, what they were doing, they were using S units where they were computing S units for a very particular set S, which is the empty set. And first of all, they're mapping it into a lattice as a lattice of R to the M. And then there's a two-step process to uh, create a function that hides this lattice. First, you find uh, each point here is associated to a lattice in R to the N, and then each lattice is associated to a quantum state. So you have here a correspondence by composition between elements in R to the M and quantum states. And we're doing exactly the same. We have a little bit of extra information to keep, but what we're gonna do here is we're gonna identify S units as members of a sub-lattice of R to the N and is times Z to the K, and these guys will be mapped to lattices and then to quantum states using the exact same mapping here. Now, as I said before, one way of identifying an S unit is to say, well, it's, it's uh, uh, an element such that its principal ideal it can be multiplied by certain powers of the PIs to get the trivial ideal. The trivial ideal is generated by one, not so surprisingly, it's a unit multiplicatively. Now, the way we do it is, well, here again, I'm gonna have to ask for a little bit of faith from the audience. Elements in your field can be mapped uh, in R to the M in a very canonical way, okay? And then you're gonna take also those valuations here, the VI, and then you're gonna keep that extra information, and that means that there is a correspondence between your units and uh, certain points in this lattice. 
so a sub lattice that's in r to the m times z to the k. Now it turns out you can also use, um, you can look at all these uh, points here, whether or not they're in your subgroup, gamma s, sorry, lambda s, and then there's an embedding in r to the m of your field, and then you're going to map elements here to lattices in r to the n. And the way you do it is by saying, well, I take the part that's um, in r to the m, and I map it to this lattice, and I take the part that's in z to the k, and I map it to this lattice, and if I happen to hit an s unit, then I'll get the trivial lattice. And that trivial lattice behaves really nice multiplicatively in the sense that every time I hit that trivial lattice, I reset. So that's going to give me my function that hides the s unit group. So how, here's how it works. As I said before, I can define those two functions, okay, given the part of my input that is r to the m, I can calculate this lattice. And then given this part in z to the k, I can calculate this lattice. And I can do that whether or not I'm looking at a point that's an s unit. It may be complete gibberish. It may be just some random point in r to the m, z to the k. These two lattices will exist, okay? So I can calculate them, okay? And I can multiply them together, and I get something such that, well, when I get an S unit, it gives me the trivial lattice. And when I do not get an S unit, it just gives me a lattice, OK? Now, what I want from this function that hides my S unit group is, first of all, well, that it hides the S unit group. But also, I want that when, when inputs are close together, I want those lattices to be sort of similar for a certain notion of you know, uh, lattices being close together. And when they defer, when they're far apart, then I also want that those lattices to defer. And that these are, this is a classical information. So we had to prove those, those two properties here to then use the um, uh, quantum encoding that was in uh, uh, Eisentrager, Holger, and Kitaev, and Song's paper. Um, oops, sorry. So we had to take that uh, encoding that takes a lattice in R to the M and then uh, derives a quantum state, OK? And given the good properties that our classical encoding uh, of our information into lattices have, then uh, and given the properties of this uh, encoding into quantum states, we have exactly what we want. But that property is really a combination of, first, the classical encoding, and then the quantum encoding, which was in uh, uh, Eisentrager and Al paper. And then when you combine those two results, you get what you want, which is essentially that you can find your S unit efficiently. OK? So to summarize, um, so it's, we had a whole bunch of problems that we wanted to calculate. Okay? And we said that you know, all those problems, they were basically reducible to the problem of finding S units in your number field. And that S unit problem, we expressed it as uh, an instance of the hidden subgroup problem following the same general strategy that was done in, in, um, in the Eisentrager, Hogren, Kidaif, and Song paper. So, and it worked. And now, of course, it opens up the natural question, like how can we even more generalize this? I mean, the non, clearly the non-abelian HSP uh, problem will certainly remain a challenge for, for a long time. But there might be, even in the uh, abelian case, uh, some problems in number theory that we haven't considered. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're hoping to, to work on that. So thank you for your attention. Thanks for the talk. And we have some time for questions. So, yeah. 
have one question. So you said that in some of those cases, uh, the reduction is actually classical to S units. So I was wondering that, like, for I mean, that that S is actually depends on your input, and um, so I was wondering if do you like need factoring to actually uh, compute that set S for for your given number field or no? Uh, maybe I should have. Um I should have been more clear about what S, I mean, S is your input. Oh, S is an input. Yes. Right? So it is, OK. But sometimes, well, when, you, when you, for example, say, OK, you, you want the principal idea problem, well, you have to take your ideal, and then you're going to have to factor the ideal to determine which set S you need for this reduction to give you a solution to the principal idea problem. In this case, okay. you need to construct, in, the, in this particular, so, in general, when you want uh, an S unit group, you, you, you give S yeah, yeah. as the input. Now, to, to use this reduction, while well, every problem has a different set S, right? And, yeah, yeah, and no, oftentimes, that's, that's my question. Was oftentimes, like, there is yeah. factorization. I mean, typically, for the principal idea problem, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I thought the norm equation is probably two, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. And okay. also for the uh, rate class group. OK. Great. And there's Thanks. even discrete log. More questions? So I have read your uh, Soda version paper before, and I think that's basically Sorry, which, which paper? Uh, your Soda version paper. Oh, okay. So, and I think that's basically the, the same thing as, as what you're showing here. So what progress have you made uh, in the I mean, past so year? far? Yeah, yes. Any, any new things to tell? Well, I mean, we need, we need to clean up. Um, so in the soda, soda is a is a ten page paper. So um, so then you know you have it doesn't really allow you to give a lot of details. And in particular, if you have a long list of problems, well, we only we basically only uh, gave some details on the principal idea problem and the class group problem on on the the published soda paper. And then towards the end, we say, oh, we listed a list of problems where you said, where we said, well, you know, the, these are also following the same framework, we, would be solvable using the same techniques. And we gave, you know, the general idea, but we clearly didn't have enough space to to develop those reductions. So first, for example, like uh, when when we we need we need to clarify the reduction, the, the precise steps of the reduction for each of the problems that I mentioned before. That, that I think is, is the immediate follow-up work that we're doing so that it's clear. Because so far, all we said is, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to, to, to do it. But now we actually have to give details on that. OK, thanks. Maybe we have time for one quick question. Maybe the next speaker can set up well, if there's one quick question. All right, if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again.